Thank you for joining us for another power-packed message provided by Monroe Global Incorporated and MonroeGlobal.com. We transform followers into leaders and leaders into agents of change. We hope that this message is a blessing to you as you advance your life and discover your purpose. Now, let's go into the message. Turn your Bibles to the book of Matthew chapter 6. We're going to be focusing on session number 8, number 9, sorry, session number 9 as we pursue this theme. Good to see our friends from Freeport over here. Praise God. I love you guys. Matthew chapter 6, verse 10, specifically verse 9 and 10, is our focus for this entire two years. This will take us into 2008. The question was asked, how and what should we pray for? And the answer was given by Jesus. Here's what to pray for and how to pray. He said, when you pray, pray like this. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. This is the most important petition that Jesus gave us to pray. He began by saying, Our Father who is in heaven, holy is your name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done. In the series of books that we have produced so far, we are at our third series in the kingdom. I want to strongly recommend that everyone get a copy of the latest book entitled The Most Important Person on Earth. If you read this book, you will understand, I believe, what we're talking about this entire year, but also the mind of God because it helps you to capture the concepts of that prayer. It was what I call a colonial prayer. Jesus came to earth with one assignment. I'm going to give you a new word to write down. His assignment was to recolonize the earth. Everybody say recolonize. He came to earth to recolonize. Write that down, please. He didn't come to earth just to colonize because earth was colonized before with heaven. But it only lasted two chapters. We are not sure how long those chapters are in chronological years. But the earth did have the colony of God on it and it was in human form in a family called the Adamic family God did walk and talk with man without worship services Adam was in pure common union with God without going to prayer meetings and singing there was no sacrifices, no altars, no religion, no traditions, no customs, no offerings, no begging, no brokenness. The colony was intact. And something went wrong. Adam was God's first colony on earth. And earth was God's plan from the beginning to be the place that he chose among 
millions of planets to I want to use the term as human I hope I don't get in trouble for this he wanted to to have an experiment he wanted to see what would happen if he extended his invisible kingdom to a visible pl place through his own children he wanted to establish what we call a kingdom colony in a foreign territory this morning I want to focus on the concept of colonization which is the first one and that is community if you were not here the last two sessions please get the CDs and the DVDs for they are important foundations for this session but we're going to focus on the kingdom colonization concept of what community of what say it loud write that down we want to focus on the kingdom colonization concept of community this is important because it destroys the idea that Jesus Christ came to earth to bring a religion a community is a product of a national ideology the word national is from the word nation nations produce communities as a matter of fact a nation is a conglomerate of communities there cannot be a nation unless there is a group of communities I want to focus in this segment on understanding the priority of community in kingdoms please get this concept first of all God's ultimate goal is simple his goal was to extend his invisible kingdom of heaven on the physical earth through his family sons of men so God's goal was to establish a heavenly kingdom colony on earth which is very clear in his first statement in scripture regarding humanity God says let them have dominion over the earth the reason why God created you was not to bring you to heaven according to the scriptures and I can find many references in the Bible to show you this but because of a limitation in time I won't do that but I can show you scores of references in the Bible where it says you existed in God before anything was The Bible says, for example, in Ephesians chapter 1, He chose you in Him before the foundations of the world. Can you please repeat that with me? He chose me in Him when? Before the foundation of the world. So that means you existed where? In Him when? Before the earth was even made my point is this coming to heaven is not his priority you were already there clap religion and that includes Buddhism Hinduism Shintoism Baha'i Islamic studies and beliefs and Christianity all of them focus on man going to some heaven as a matter of fact the motivation for terrorism is the promise of heaven Christianity as a religion is weak because it trains you to leave earth
But going to heaven is not God's goal for you. If going to heaven was his priority, he should have killed you the day you believed. Am I right? God wants you to stay out of heaven so badly. He created healing. <laughs> the fastest route to heaven is death. And God keeps on postponing it. He protected you all this week to keep you out of heaven. The car that didn't hit you, the one you didn't see, he said, I don't want you to come up here. The poison in the can that you ate couldn't affect your liver because he didn't want you up there. Heaven is not his goal. His goal is for you to colonize earth. Let them have dominion over earth. So his original goal, and still is, is to establish a heavenly kingdom colony on earth. Now you used to be where? In him. And him used to be where? In heaven. So you were already in heaven. God told Jeremiah, before you was conceived in your mother's womb, I knew, past tense, you. I'm listening to the Holy Spirit, so he talks loud. Write this down, please. His goal was to colonize earth with heaven. Say that. God's goal was to colonize earth with heaven. Say it with your mouth. God's goal was to colonize earth with heaven. Say it again. God's goal is to colonize earth with heaven. Say it again. God's goal is to colonize earth with heaven. Listen, that is the key to the Bible. Now, this is the theme of our focus because that's the ultimate prayer of Jesus. It's a colonial prayer. Let's read it again. Our Father, come on out loud. Our Father who is in heaven, hallowed be your name. That means holy is your name. Your kingdom come and your will be done. Where? On earth. How? as it is in heaven. He says, you pray that for the rest of your time here. Don't pray for earth to go to heaven, but pray the reverse. Pray for heaven to come to earth. That's colonization. Now, the goal of colonization, this is an important sentence to write down, please. Get your pen and write this down. I'm going to leave it up until you write it. If you didn't bring anything to write on, please get your Bible, turn to Malachi. There's a blank page between Malachi and Matthew. Write this statement there because this will help you understand the mind of Jesus. He was motivated by the mandate to colonize earth again. He came to earth to recolonize earth. So you got to study what is colonization, what is a colony, and what is the goal of colonization. When the British took over these islands, they colonized the Bahamas. The goal of a kingdom in colonization is to establish a replicate or a replica of its kingdom and its influence and the culture of that kingdom and the values of that kingdom and the morals of that kingdom and the lifestyle of that kingdom in a foreign territory through a community of people that reflect the culture of the kingdom. So the goal of 
colonization is to duplicate and replicate a kingdom, a country in another place. The Romans were the first historical empire to colonize Europe. This is why they are still considered the most successful and the longest reigning kingdom empire in history. They are the most effective in history. No other kingdom was as effective as the Roman Empire because they used God's system. The Romans' goal was to duplicate Rome in every part of the world. And if you read history, Rome ruled the world from Africa right across Europe all the way to England and Scotland. And everywhere you went in Europe, by the way, when the Romans were ruling the world, there was no France and Spain and Portugal and England and Germany and Poland and Switzerland. No, everything was called Rome. Those countries were created after the Roman Empire fell apart and it broke up into these different pieces. Therefore, France and Germany, Spain and Portugal, Poland and Czechoslovakia, and all of the nations of the entire known world at that time are still Roman. This is why even though our languages seem to be different, if you listen carefully, we all have basic Latin running through our languages. Because when a kingdom colonizes a place, its goal is to bring its culture and its values and its morals and its lifestyle in the entire territory so that the entire territory looks like the original home kingdom. And so you have heard this statement, which is written by the Romans, when in Rome, wherever you are, doesn't matter where you are, if you're in Rome, if you are in Africa, if you are in London, in England at that time, if you were in Spain or in Germany, they said, when you are in our territory, you do as we do. When in Rome, say it. Do as the Romans do. Say it. When in Rome, do as the Romans. Now, in other words, when you are in a colony, you act like the kingdom. Are you thinking? So if you sit in this place today and you claim to be in the kingdom of God, that means you belong to the nation of heaven. Then when in heaven do as heaven do. Let me put it another way. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth just like it is in the home country. So you can't claim to be a kingdom citizen and then living like another country. Religion makes provision for private behavior. Oh, I'm under the anointing. You better hear me. That's why religion is despicable to Jesus. He told the disciples, he told the Pharisees rather, he says, you make me sick. Matter of fact, he used a worse word than that, but y'all can't take it. The word woe is what he used. Woe means damned you. Yes, I said it. That's what it means in the Hebrew. Can I put it another way? It means go to hell. I'm sorry, that's what it means. 
Woe to you Pharisees and scribes. He says, you put burdens on these people. Rituals. Keep this. Do this. Don't do that. He said, all this heavy stuff. He says, and you yourself cannot lift one of those assignments with your little finger. You burden these people with all this religious stuff and make them twice the children of the devil. Wow. Oh, he hated religion. They claimed to know Jehovah, but was not behaving like where Jehovah is from. The British colonized the Bahamas. They didn't allow us to read African history. It was illegal. Why? You are in our kingdom. You will read Sir Francis Drake. You will read Henry VIII. You will study Anne Boleyn. You're going to memorize Shakespeare. We're going to take over your mind. Because when you colonize, a people they think like the kingdom that's why this bible is not a weekend book you pick this up on sunday morning and bring it with you shame on you this is your brainwashing system come on clap with me this you know why i am so different from many people I eat this every day Jesus says I love my wife and I prove my love by the washing of water by the word I keep brainwashing my wife his wife is ecclesia why I don't want you to remember your history Are you thinking? You came out of sin, lust, greed, pornography, masturbation, drug. He said, I'm going to wash your brain. I don't want to remember your history. I'm going to give you mine, goodness, mercy, faithfulness, love, joy, peace, long-suffering, patience, kindness. He said, I'm going to wash you. Can people tell the difference on your job between you and them? They cuss when they get mad. You cuss when you get mad. And then you come back to BFM and sit here and say, I love you, Lord. So you confuse them. They said, I thought you were from another country. Religion makes room for that. It is possible for people to say this. Don't make me lose my religion. What I mean by this is, look, I just got, I just wearing this, you know, don't fool with me. This is like a clothing for me. I, I take this off and whoop you. And put it back on and go sing and be a deacon. That's a religion. It, religion allows that. Let me ask you a question. Have you ever said, don't make me lose my Bahamianism? No, you don't take off your citizenship. The purpose and the goal of colonization is to duplicate the kingdom in a foreign territory. To replicate it. So that when you go to territory, you feel like you never left the head kingdom. Are you with me? People are not supposed to have to go to heaven to experience heaven. All they got to do is meet you. Okay, let me try another way. Philip was so messed up. He must have been a Bahamian. 
Instead of saying, Jesus, man, Jesus been with this guy for three and a half years. Instead of saying, Jesus, show us the headquarters country. Show us the government of heaven. Show us the Father, the source from where you came. Christ says, how long have I been with you? You ain't got to go there to experience there. I'm here. You want to talk to me, man. I'm talking to someone. He says, he that has seen me don't need to go to heaven. Clap loud. <laughs> if you want to know how the British kingdom drives cars, you don't need to go to England because we drive on the left. If you want to know how the kingdom of Great Britain what they drink three times a day plus supper you ain't got to go to England if you are a true true Bahamian true true first thing you want in the morning first thing they got you brain washed your, your brain is washed what you ask for? Tea. In America, it's coffee. See, that's different kingdom. Us, we British, man. Tea. And it gotta be lipped. Anybody here with me? Now, you're also sophisticated. You know, you all, been, you all are being recolonized lately. You know, this herbal, herbal. Listen, give me the real thing. And I want sweet milk in this thing. And I gotta be carnation con. Dance. Anybody been colonized here? Give me a praise. Oh, glory. And you want some bread with some butter and jam. You want to soak it in the tea. Oh, and then just suck it out before you eat it. You all better act like you're colonized. Doc, you don't know about that. that, that that's, that's, that's colonization talk. Yeah. That's the goal of colonization. It's to replicate the kingdom in a foreign place. I am amazed that in my lifetime I grew up, and I grew up with people in school. We went to school together, kitten, kindergarten, grade school, junior high. It's amazing. Some of them went to England to study. When they came back, I couldn't understand them. Come on, y'all go with me for a second. This, this is important. Now, I know the boy. Yes, boy, we, you know, we climbed Tambourine Tree together, man. All of a sudden, I can't understand you. You see, when you get a taste of the home country, you come back. Come on, y'all talk to me now. They start talking British. Jolly well, old chap. Hi there. Hey, brother, say, how you doing? Don't say, how are thou? But you see, when you connect with the kingdom, you get a new language. Speaking in tongues is a sign that you're reconnected. That's why your friends, you go home now, and they say, oh, you go to Miles Monroe. No, it ain't Miles Monroe. Oh, you go, what, what they're saying is, you changed. You changed. The colonization takes over your whole life. Okay, make a note of this right here. I'm gonna show you this stuff. The three divine objectives of a kingdom is to colonize, to create a culture and to produce a community that is not religious that's a national objective to colonize to create a culture and to produce a community so let me put it another way the goal of a kingdom is to build a heavenly community on earth through cultivating a kingdom colony so God wants a colony of heaven on earth that looks just like heaven. 
Listen to his prayer again. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth, just like it is in heaven. What is God's will in heaven? Well, there's nobody poor. The streets are made of gold. The gates are made of pearls. Everybody's singing. There's no sickness, no crime, no depression, no divorce, no brokenness. There's no one with infectious disease. And everything in the place is bowing down to him. He says, I want to see that on earth. I want to see that on earth. That means no sickness, no disease, no brokenness, no divorce, no oppression, no fear. None of the things that are not in heaven should be on earth. Do you know why God cast Lucifer out? He was creating a counterculture. Lucifer was excommunicated from citizenship because he was rebelling against the government. He was a rebel. By the way, the word rebel, rebellion, is the Hebrew word for sin, S-I-N. Write it down. The word sin is a singular word. Christ died for the sin, singular, of the world. The behaviors of, of a citizen who declared independence from their kingdom are called sins but the act of independence is sin so rebellion against the government or a kingdom is called sin in Hebrew life after the rebellion can be described as sins anybody with me sure okay so Jesus came to cultivate the life of heaven on earth so the goal of God is to colonize earth with a colony of people who live under the kingdom again that's why I used the term recolonization if the Bahamas wanted to recolonize itself it would first have to <laughs> cancel all of its own constitution and reconnect to the king and queen of England if they were a kingdom, which they are not now. They are a democracy. They changed too. But to recolonize, you would have to give up your independence con constitution and receive. Hey, boys, say receive. Re means what? Again. Breathe, the prefix. Receive the old constitution of the kingdom that you declare independence from. So God says things like, when you come back to me, all things have passed away. Your old constitution you lived with passed away. Behold, everything is new again. Why? Because my thoughts are not your thoughts. And my ways are not your ways. You cannot come back to the kingdom of God with your private constitution. God's divine objective. Out loud, let's say together. What is God's divine objective? Developing a heavenly culture on earth through kingdom colonization. So the goal of God is to develop this culture because the culture produces the community. What makes the Spanish people or the Cuban people or the Haitian people or the Jewish people in America a community within a nation is that there are pockets of culture. They even got Chinatown all over America. They got Cuban town all over America. Now they got Haitian town 
all over America. They ain't got Baham in town yet. Because enough of us ain't going there to eat peas and rice, you know, and stuff. <laughs> in other words, what makes a community is culture. Your culture can be so strong that even though you are in a nation, you become a nation unto yourself. It's all over America. It's all over Europe. When I travel to France, when I go to Germany, when I've been into Poland, when you go visit England, my God, there are countries in England. Yesterday, CNN, you all saw that? Oh man, they had a serious story on yesterday. It's a documentary. And they were talking about, and I watched it twice. I wanted, it came on twice. I said, I got to see this. This is kingdom principle. They are showing, here's, here, here's what they call it. They call it the enemy within. It's a brand new documentary. It came on yesterday on CNN. Where they did an entire research on the Islamic communities in England. And they are showing that there are communities in England that are out of touch with England. And they are breeding terrorism right in England. And the, listen, and the people in the community that are encouraging terrorism are British citizens born there. My point is this. You can be born in a country and never enter it. Because you were born into a culture that was so strong. Oh, hallelujah. So they are in England, but not of England. You should hear some of the quotes, the statements being made by the British citizens. I was like, this is impossible for them to be making these statements. They said, we are against democracy. And someday this whole country shall be under Sharia law. And I'm like, what? They said, the day will come when all of England shall be Muslim. They are saying it. What's the government to do? You can't lock up a whole community. It's amazing how people want to be in politics. They want to rule countries. I don't appreciate how complicated life is. I said to myself when I heard that, I said, I don't want to be Prime Minister of Great Britain. How do you deal with that? Your citizens are planning to destroy you. How do you deal with that as a, as a prime minister? One of the guys says, I hate democracy, but we like it because it allows us to be what we are. You all don't understand, it's deep. Bahamians, wake up. Don't think this is far from us. You folks from Guyana know what I'm talking about from Guyana. It is serious down south in Caribbean. Trinidad, it's rough. I've been there a few weeks ago. It's strong down there. How do you govern a country where there's so many factions and you claim to be democracy? That means you give your enemy the right to kill you and you protect his right to do it. In my book on the kingdom, please read the book on the kingdom. The one called Kingdom Principles. Please read the book. Your pastor's smart, you know. I wrote some things that you ain't read. You, you, you won't read the book. I did a whole chapter on the weakness of democracy. 
That's why Christ didn't bring a democracy. Democracy without God is impossible. And there only can be one God in democracy. And that has to be legislated. I'm saying that to you young people. Come back and be prime minister and do exactly what I tell you right now, okay? You put it in the legislation, in the constitution, that our God shall be Jehovah. It has to be in the constitution. And let me tell you something. Some of you think, and I don't, you know, I ain't to your body at all. Some of you think that this discussion about our constitutional reconsiderations is a light issue. They want to take the safest thing out. The safest thing in our constitution is that this commonwealth shall be governed on the principles of the Christian faith. That's the most important statement because it tells you who is our national God. And blessed is the nation whose God, singular, is the Lord. Come on, give him a hand. Praise God. Hold that for me. Hold that for me. I'm sure this is, why am I getting off on this? See this here? It's American money. In God we trust. It's written there. The problem is there is a man in Congress today in America who said, for the last 250 years, you all have put your hand on a Bible in order to inaugurate a congressman. He said, I want the Quran. Now, read again. In God we trust. They got to put an S on the end of that now. Don't take it lightly. It's already begun in America. Don't sit around hoping you are safe. It is my job as an ambassador of our country, heaven, to speak to you prophetically the truth without compromise that we must not have any other gods before him. Oh, hear me. You're going to be prime minister one day. You remember this sermon. God took a group of slaves out of Egypt. He wants to create a nation out of them. His first, first statement, first. Did you get me? He said, Moses, bring them to me in the desert. They came out. Okay, he said, the first thing, number one, numero uno. Aina. Thou shall have no other gods before me. That's the first command he gave them. Because whoever your God is becomes the reference for your national life. And if you don't declare your God first, then there can never be unity in that nation. This is why I got problems with these gay churches. Oh, please don't write me any letters. You all can have your gay church. But when they claim to be from the same kingdom is my problem. Because this God don't change his mind. Sometime I believe that the Christian God is not the God of Jesus Christ. Because there are, a, there are a number of Christian churches, Christian churches in England. I went to visit two of them that are Christian gay churches. Sign on the wall, Christian gay community church. You 
you sleeping? And the rainbow is here. Maybe they got another God. This God said that that's an abomination. Maybe he changed his mind. Or they have another God. That's the point I'm making. They got another God. They got a God who adapts to their private perversions. His love is so accommodating, it is completely perverted. And they use the word love. God loves everybody. No matter what's your orientation, he loves everybody. God is love. Well, how come God sending people to hell? God is love as much as he is hate. You listen to me. If he didn't hate, he would never die to get rid of sin. God hates sin so much. Instead of killing you, which was supposed to be a penalty, he jumped in the way of the bullet. You didn't get away. You did not get away. You were substituted for. The penalty was not excused. It paid. He hates sin. He killed himself so he won't kill you. Don't tell me God loves everybody. God hates sin. And he called that kind of lifestyle perversion, abomination. He said, I hate it. He burned the whole city up because of it. Now you're going to tell me 70 bishops could sanctify that kind of stuff? Those bishops do not belong to the colony of heaven. They belong to a religion of earth. Let me give you something. Uh, write this list down, please. When a kingdom colonizes, the kingdom colonizes by a culture. So I'm going to give you a list of how cultures are manifested. Now, I know you came here, didn't plan to write anything. Please write this list down because it tells you what we have to study for the next 25 years. This is the list that you and I have to study for the next 25 years of our life. You don't need to get any deep, deeper than this. If a kingdom takes over a country or a territory and it colonizes it, this list is what the kingdom is after. And that's what the whole Bible is about. The Bible is about this list. It's about Jesus saying, look, I want this to show up on earth. Number one, every kingdom manifests its culture in values. Number two, in priorities. Culture is manifested also in behaviors. Number four, culture is manifested in standards. Number five, culture is manifested in celebration. And each one of these we'll be teaching on. I'm telling you, they, you have to teach on it. That's why God, for example, God to a children of Israel, he says, celebrate this, and celebrate that, and celebrate the feast. Why? Because kingdoms, culture, got to have celebrations in it. Whatever you celebrate is what you elevate. Let me say it again. Whatever you celebrate, you elevate. I'll say it again. Whatever you celebrate, you elevate. So if you got Gay Pride Day as a national celebration, that tells me your culture. We say it again. Whatever you celebrate, you elevate. Whatever you elevate, you worship. What do you celebrate? I told the men's ministry, I met with them, this is serious business. The next 10 years, I'm going to be working on the men. Hey, I want every man, pull your pants up and get your act together. Stop missing men's ministry. 
and I'm speaking under the Holy Ghost. Listen to me. I told him, look, we are going to create a new day in the Bahamas. It's going to be called Husband's Day. Why? We celebrate Father's Day, but you see, that's weak because some of them fathers ain't husbands. We got to celebrate what God loves. He loves husbands. Husbands love your wives, he says. We don't celebrate husbands. That's why we got sweethearts. We're going to celebrate Wife's Day. Plenty of women whose mother ain't wife. Whatever you celebrate, you elevate. We're going to celebrate a new day in the Bahamas beginning with Real Men Ministry. We're going to call it Boys Day. Why? We have a day that we celebrate boys. We're going to get thousands of boys together and train them how to be kingdom men. Whatever you celebrate, you what? Elevate. Some of you only celebrate your wedding anniversary once a year. I have come under the Holy Ghost to tell you, celebrate your wife every week. Amen. Whatever you celebrate, I can't hear you. Whatever you celebrate, I can't hear you. Whatever you celebrate, I know quiet now. I call my wife. My, my, my wife is speaking right now in Trinidad preaching at the church right now. Bless the Lord again. I call her. Last night she called me actually. We're talking. I said, sweetheart, I'm with you. I miss you badly. But I'm with you in the pulpit, baby. You're going to be all right. Daddy right there. Mm -hmm. Just smell my perfume. Give you the anointing. Praise God. You preach the word to those people. Represent your papa well. Celebrate my wife. Say it. Whatever you celebrate, you say it again. Whatever you, you. That's why you must attend the people's ministry, the singers' ministry. Somebody say, well, I need to go. Shut up and go. We want you keep complaining. Ain't nothing to do. Ain't nothing to do. And then we plan to do. You don't show up. Oh, no. Ain't nothing to do. They don't love me. Shut up. Come to the meetings. I ain't coming to visit you. I ain't coming to visit you. I plan the meeting, you stay home and criticize me. We got a marriage conference coming up. If you married, be in there. If you ain't married, be in there twice. Clap, clap, clap. But ain't nobody care about our marriages. We plan the seminars. Whatever you celebrate, you elevate. Whatever you ignore, you destroy. Ignore your wife. See what happens. Ignore your children. See what happens to them. Ignore your parents. See what happens to your relationship. Ignore me as your pastor. See what happens. You start becoming bitter, angry, critical, complaining. Whatever you ignore, you destroy. Whatever you celebrate, you elevate. Culture is showing what you celebrate. The Bahamas, for example, we spend over, I think it's now $30 million on Junkadoo. What do we spend on healing young men? Whatever you celebrate, you elevate. So the, the boys go into jail and Junkadoo prosper. It's culture. We call it what? Culture, remember? Culture is showing what you celebrate. That's why we celebrate communion. And by the way, I apologize for that table last week, please. I already killed somebody for that, okay? Listen. Whatever you celebrate, God, Jesus said, look, when, every time you drink this cup and eat this bread, he was, he was putting in a celebration. Don't you forget that I died for you. Celebrate. Celebrate what I did. He said, celebrate. Keep elevating me. Celebrate. That's why you celebrate your birthday. Because you want it to be important all the time. 
That's why you celebrate this. Next week, next week, Friday coming, just Friday. I want everybody here at 10 o'clock. If you ain't working, 10 o'clock here. What? We're celebrating his death and resurrection. It's a celebration. It's our culture and our community. We are a community of heaven, and heaven sent him to earth to die. We're going to celebrate that 10 o'clock on Friday. That's why they call it a holy day. You pronounce it holiday. It's holy day. It's sanctified day set apart to celebrate his death. Whatever you celebrate. There's a negative to that, you know. Lord, why are you doing it? Give me all kinds of things. Lord, please don't let me say these things. When you're under anointing, you're not responsible for a lot of things to say. He said, told me this. He said, tell them, if your sweetheart sends you roses, send them back. Wrong celebration. Whatever you celebrate, Don't, act, don't even accept the gift. It's a, it's a celebration. There's some things you don't want to celebrate because you don't want to elevate it. Yes, you slept with him a couple of times, but now you are under the kingdom anointing. That stops. He calls you, tell him, I ain't sleeping with you no more. Don't call me back. I ain't celebrating no phone call. please okay stop write this down please culture is manifested number six in what morality number seven culture is manifested in what relationships you can tell a people's culture by their relationships first of all who they relate to as a country who they relate to among themselves and what they relate to Be your culture. Number eight, culture is manifested in ethics. You look at the Bahamas and you study our culture and you'll find what our ethics are. Our ethics reveal our culture. Hmm. It is ethical for a man to sleep with a man. And we think it's cute. So our culture is being exposed. If you accept certain ethical behavior, like padding the books, Increasing the price on the woman house material that you build in. There's a culture problem here. Not finishing the people's house. And took the money. I'm talking to you. Repent. Go back and give them the money back. If you ain't got the money, tell them I can pay it back piece at a time. Clean up your life. That's why you ain't blessed. You ain't blessed because you ain't representing the culture of heaven. Everybody clap my help out here. Some are feeling lonely when he's talking to me. Listen, ethics reveal culture. Those of you from Nigeria, oh, you all know what I'm talking about now. <laughs> I sat in the palace with the president of Nigeria having breakfast three of us and he said Dr. Monroe we need you in Nigeria I said yes Mr. President that's why I'm here he said no we need you plenty he says would you like to move here you all better treat me good and that ain't the first invitation I said, Mr. President, I can't live here. I said, but I would come here as much as I possibly can. He said, it's challenging to be the president and work with a government, Congress, and Senate where the ethics are the problem. You can't rule. Everybody's on the take. Corruption has become the moral fabric of the culture. 
listen to me when your when corruption is a culture your nation will be poor automatically yeah. Yeah. see if one or two people corrupt you, 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 you can make it you know but when the whole culture and we better be careful I was thinking the other day I wonder why these politicians run in well, why are they really running? In, in other words, what's your real motive? What is it really? What's your... Do you really want to serve the Bahamas? Do you really put the people before your purse? What is your ethical conviction? Are you willing to go without to make your community better? Or are you positioning yourself to get what you can while you could? culture write this down number nine is this good culture is manifested in social norms and we're gonna do each one of these separately if I show you scriptures oh we're gonna go into the Bible this year social norms means anything that the society accepts as normal like sweetheart When sweethearting becomes a culture, by the way, for our visitors, sweethearting means infidelity. Okay, infidelity. That means a man ain't faithful to his wife. Or a woman ain't faithful to her husband. Both sides. Infidelity. When you accept that as normal, then you are telling us your culture. So even in the religious Christian church, you got the pastor preaching. And he's sleeping with the members? Yeah. What? He said, well, you know how we are, he say. That means this is a social norm. That means he ain't in the kingdom of God. So stop going to that church now. Stop going there now. You know the pastor is a gay fella. And the deacon is his sweetheart. And you still sitting in that church. Listen. I worry about them, you know. It is you I concerned about. You know that and still there. You all better clap. Don't leave me by myself. I'm here. This is crazy. I know some of y'all say, why Pastor Miles time is being long. Blah blah blah. Listen, I, I listen, I keep trying to cut the service down, you know. They keep getting me up at 10, 9, 10, 10, 18, 6. I don't preach long, y'all just go long. But in this ministry, we're going to live clean, preach the truth, and we're going to live right. And any pastor on this team messes up, I sit them down. That includes me. Catch that. Catch that. Everybody say culture. It is not normal for a sissy to be on the piano in this place. It ain't normal have no gay fellow there preaching. It ain't normal have no deacon with his leg wide open with no woman who ain't his wife. Oh Lord, help me, please. Oh, I feel scared now. You all don't throw a rock at me. Don't pull to me. Fix your life, young man. Next time a woman wink at you and you're married, tell her, that ain't my culture. Come on, clap somebody. That ain't my culture. I used to be in that culture. But I've been colonized. Say it. I've been colonized. Say it. I've been colonized. Write this down quick. Number 10. Culture manifests in what? Attitudes. You go to certain countries, and everyone got the same attitude, you know. It's a, it's a culture. In Brazil, ooh, nice people. Everybody nice. There's an attitude there. You go to some countries in, in, in the Caribbean. <laughs> I 
attitude. They serve you in a restaurant. Here. And the fellow say, this cold. Cold? So what do you want me to do about it? It happens in this country. The soup cold. Okay, it's cold. Okay. Thank you. Okay. I'll fix it. Let me show you up. Put it in the microwave. Culture is manifesting an attitude. There are some countries I'm not happy going to. Everybody think they're better than you. Close up in there. It can become a culture. That's why the Bible says, let love prevail among you. That's the culture of heaven. Let forgiveness prevail among you. What a culture. The joy, unspeakable, full of glory, be in our culture. Everybody happy. Even when you're going in the fiery furnace, you're smiling. These people are crazy. Yes, sir. Because the Bible says, when you are in fiery trials, rejoice, for they have come to make you strong. What kind of people are this? The rent can't be paid and they're smiling. Why? Because God knows that he tired of this place you're renting. He's about to give you your own house. Put the clap right there. That's a good piece of clap you're renting. I ain't finished yet. Write this down. Number 11. Culture shows up in dress. You going out, you belong to the kingdom of God, all your breasts up. God said, wait a minute now. Let's see. You represent me? Well, everybody wearing it. No, no, no. You ain't everybody. They from another culture. You from the kingdom of God. Clap fast, please. So, this guy, how you look? Everybody say dress the way you want to be addressed. I want to be addressed as an ambassador. So I dress like an ambassador. Sir. You want to be respected, you dress respectful. So pull your pants up, man. Snoop Doggy Dog got his hair plaid. Hair down by his pants down by your ankle. I mean, the reason for drawers is to cover your drawers. I don't understand this. I don't want to see your underwear, brother, sister. I don't want to see your navel, ladies. I don't need your navel. I got my own navel at home. Keep your navel to yourself. Cover your navel. Is it navel or navel? Y'all leave me alone. Say it means the same. This is my sister. I from Beta. That's a cultural word. But y'all know just what I mean. Culture shows up in your dress. You go among certain tribes, they wear certain clothes. Certain places I go, women walk around with nothing on their top. And it never bothers me. You know, place. why? That's their culture. But in our culture, it ain't so. So put on your bra and cover your bra. Clap now if I dare. <laughs> the Bible never tells you what to wear, you know. It simply says dress modestly. Modestly means that which is presentable. Young people, you come to this ministry, you don't dress to please me. You under the king. And your clothes gives his kingdom away. Number two, foods give culture away, manifest culture. Number 13, how you respond gives your culture away. How you do it? Yeah, right. That's a response in, the, in, in our culture. <laughs> Suck your teeth, they call it. See how you respond to people? Gives your culture away. Only Bahamas does that. I ain't been in no country where no one else does that. 
<laughs> and I got beaten many times for that. My mother came in the kitchen and I listened. <laughs> Hair on the floor, pick it back up, put it back on. <laughs> One backhand, head off. <laughs> How do people respond? Eh? See, you can give yourself away. But so, as a kingdom of God citizen, how do you respond when people don't treat you right at work? Well, I can get her back. No, how do you respond? Do good to those who despitefully use you. Bless those who persecute you. Your response is supposed to be for a different culture. Buy lunch for those who lie on you. It says that, that do good to those who abuse you. Different responses. You slap a man, bam. You expect him to slap you back. In this culture. Kingdom says no. Turn the next cheek. Hit this one too so I can have a balanced pain. Come on, give Jesus a hand. <laughs> What a response. What a response. If a man slap you on the right cheek, he says, give him the left. If a man takes your coat, give him your cloak also. Let me give you a little secret very quick, then we're going to go. What are you talking about? Oh, you're going to be so good when it came, that if you're going to see the kingdom so clear. He said, look, if a man makes you walk a mile. Now, you see, 2,000 years ago, the Roman, the culture of the Romans, they control the whole world. And the Roman culture says, all those who live as slaves in the colony, controlled by the colony, they have to be inferior to the citizens in the Romans. So the, the Romans did do something. They said, okay, the, this was a law. The law was, if a Roman soldier was walking from, let's say, Galilee to Judea, he carrying his shield and his spear and his cloak. Okay. He meets you in the farm. In, in, you know, in, in, in the village. And he gets tired carrying his spear, you know, 60, 70 pounds of steel. He would say, okay, you, come here. You had to go. He'd give you a spear. So take that for me. And the law was, you could, you could take it for him for one mile. He could, then you can walk back and go back to your work. It was law. If he wants you to carry a shield, it could be up to 75 to 80 pounds of steel. He get tired carrying it. So you carry this. You had to carry it for one mile. If a Roman soldier met you and he was cold and he wanted your coat, he'd take your coat. It was law. You had to give it to him. Now, here comes Jesus, a whole new culture. Jesus, look, if the Roman soldier, come here, Jesus. I'm sure his work. Okay. You're the Roman soldier and I'm working in the field. You come to me, you stop, you give me your, your shield or your spear. Okay, I got to carry it. So now, he has no more burden and I walk with him, and I carry his thing. So we reach one mile, and we stop. I'm supposed to give it to him, right? Because that's the law. In other words, he is in charge of my life. He rules me. Jesus is so sharp. He says, I'll tell you what. He said, tell, tell the Roman soldier, okay, I know right now the law has quit. You're no longer controlling me, but I'll take it from this point to another mile. Now, from that mile to this mile, guess who in control? That's the point I'm trying to make. Thank you very much. Everybody got that? Because now I'm the one who decided the wisdom of the kingdom. I'll never forget. Brother Ron, thank you so much, man. I tell you, bless me, Brother Ron. I'll never forget you. Because you see, that's the, that was the kingdom. He says someone broke into his bakery and stole stuff. He said, on the way that the Lord spoke to him, he just come from a Bible study we had here on the kingdom. He said, on the way that the Holy Spirit told him, he says, to tell you what, he says, whatever they steal, give it to them. You see, if someone stole something from you, they owe you. But if you give it to them, it becomes a seed. Oh, that's good stuff. And you never get a harvest from what someone stole. You get a harvest from a seed. So when someone teaches something, tell God that's a gift you give them. Now it changes into a blessing rather than a curse, and you can expect a harvest from what you gave them. 
So I know somebody didn't treat you right on the job. They got the promotion before you. Whatever it is, God said, today, stand up before me and say, Lord, I bless them with that. And watch God take you past them. Because your harvest is coming. I say your harvest is coming. Okay, just a couple more. What you drink manifests your culture. What you permit manifests your culture. Cultures are manifest what you permit. What does your community permit? I went to Amsterdam the first time, oh, maybe 20 years ago, Amsterdam. I remember the pastor said to me, I want to take you to the red light district. I say, what is that? Because you know me, I'm not smart. I'm from Baintown. He said, the red light district is where, you know, that's where action goes on. I said, action? He said, Pastor Miles, I'm going to show you the, I'm going to show you what our country has come to. He took me to this area in Amsterdam. As soon as we hit the area, I knew. Because there were demonic powers in the air. You could feel the demons just came up. <laughs> See, when you are a spiritual man, you could pick up spirits just like that. I mean, we just drove past certain street, and this thing came down to me. <laughs> I said, oh, man. I said, I said, we are in it, right? He said, we just passed it. Just in it. And we drove. He said, now, I can't stop, okay? He said, but I just drive. Just look, but I can't stop. And as we began to drive, he said, see? And I looked. And the whole street, miles and miles of stores with windows, with naked women in them. Advertising. Nothing on zero. The whole strip. And you walk along and you shop for which one you want. And it's legal. Whatever a country permits reveals their culture. I wonder why that country is a cesspool of immorality. They got some clubs in the Bahamas that I understand are becoming very excited about a little permission that our government is giving. Remember, whatever you want, permit. See, when your government gives permission, it's creating a culture. We need MPs in Parliament. We need senators who would sit there and say, you know, this is an interesting bill, or this request for license is interesting, but we cannot permit this. And we need MPs who will say now, the guy who sent this license offered me half a million. Don't forget that point. I got a choice between saying no or get a free half million. Is your culture worth half a million dollars? I need you. Listen to me. Go into politics for me, please. Because the cadre we got still ain't quite what I believe we need. That's right. That's right. Sometimes all you got is the lesser of two evils. Well, he more evil than him. So I'll choose this evil because he is quite as evil as that one. What a ter terrible choice we get sometimes. I want our government to be filled with BFM people. And when you go there, don't forget where you came from. You go there to bring the kingdom of God into that place to bring the values and the morals and the standards of God's kingdom and culture into that place so we can protect the culture of our whole country.
Let me put something to you. <laughs> Write this down. Whatever you accept reveals your culture. I mean, you accept two women getting married as being okay. It's, it, you're telling me what your culture is. You accept people living together and they ain't married. You accept that. Let me tell you something. If you're doing that, the only reason why you're doing that is because I know you. So keep it secret. Do, do keep it secret. You don't sleep with nobody who you ain't married to according to this constitution. What you accept is your culture. We will no longer accept sweethearts in this country as normal. If you don't clap, I can believe you're inside it, so clap. I look in. You know, sometimes you get hit, you don't clap. I'm looking. Pretend you're okay. <laughs> Tell your neighbor, whatever you accept, that's your culture. You know this young man ain't born again. He's on drugs. You know he got some weird friends. And you still skipping church to go away with him. You accepting this person? That's your culture. You are not in the kingdom of God. <laughs> Number seven, whatever you reject, manifest your culture. I can tell what kind of culture you are by what you hate. God hates a lot of things. Matter of fact, the Bible says the seven things God hates the most. And that list is so clear. One of them it says it's pride. A slandering tongue. Ah, hates it. He said, I hate it, he said. By the way, slander is not just lying on people, you know. Slander means that you're using truth to hurt them. Slander. Boy, did, 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 did you hear what Claudine did? Yeah. Now, it may be true. Boy, that's a may. And you start using it. Using truth to destroy a person. It happens in politics all the time. God hates it. It happens in the church. Number eight. Your distinctions manifest your culture. And number 19. Your quality standards manifest your culture. In other words, uh, what you accept to be okay tells me your culture. Like sweeping the dust under the rug rather than out of the house. Like bringing that table out here last week. That ain't our culture. If you saw it, you shouldn't have bought it. It killed the demons, made them happy. Demons were rejoicing. The Spirit of God was angry. Your quality standards tells your culture. That's why God got gold as asphalt. Let me say it again. You miss me. God put gold on his streets as asphalt. That's his standard. He walk on what you worship. He made a gate out of what you have around your neck. Pearls. Quality. The Bible says the rug around his throne is made of fiery stones. Diamonds, gems are his rug. You're supposed to represent him. I know your house got two rooms, but clean it. Paint it. Take your old chair and dust it. Why? That's my culture. This is the kingdom house. Your culture is shown in your quality. Stop going home exactly five o'clock. 
That ain't your standard. Stop coming to work late every morning. Stop taking sick days and you ain't sick. What's your quality? God have mercy on us. Standard. Let me tell you, it's tough to be around me. Some of you who be around me, you all know it's tough. I get mad fast over mediocrity. I, I heard plenty of people feeling they get mad at me, but they don't understand. I'm at a different. I said, Look, how can you accept that? How can you accept that standard? God is ashamed of what we are proud of. It's your culture. And if that's your culture, you bring it into the body of Christ, Holy Ghost going to mess you up. He's going to clean you out. He's going to whoop you. This ain't your standard. It's a culture. Wouldn't it be great when excellence is your habit? Perfection is the norm. Oh, Lord, let it be. And when you type on that at work, you don't got to use no whiteout. Sending letters out to people with little pencil mark adding the E. This is, uh, this is unbelievable from a saint. Serving in a restaurant a cup with a spot of mark on it. Excellence. I'm proud of you, man. They promoted you. I mean, they recognized you last year at that hotel. What, they, they, what they're saying is they're watching you. Brother Jones, you got the you know, man of the year, manager of the year. They watching you. They watching your excellence. I like what the, what the king said about Daniel. Daniel wasn't even a Babylonian. And the guy didn't like Daniel because he was educated. He says, his excellent spirit make me promote him. What's your standard? God gave me to you as your senior pastor. Let me tell you something. I apologize for nothing that I say in the Word of God. Whatever I say in the Word of God, I am apologizing on that. I apologize for my own private foolishness, but not from the Word of God. So don't get mad. Fix yourself in the Word of God. I would rather have 300 solid powerful citizens than 3,000 bickering, complaining, critical people. You see, they don't know, they, they don't know how hard you work to get what you get. Them long hours, and they got, they start gossiping about you, you know. They don't know the excellent spirit you've been performing for 20 years on your job. Then they get jealous of you because you pull up there in a nice car. They don't know. Last of all, and this is very important, number 20, culture is manifested in an environment. You know, you can walk into a place and you can tell what kind of people live. Right? You go to certain areas and you just go, boy, I know what kind of people live here. They put the garbage in the road in the front of the house. Your environment tells your culture. <laughs> Excellence is the nature of God. How excellent is your name in all the earth? The heavens declare your handiwork. Oh, you look at the plants and say, my God, he is so detail-oriented. He puts a hair on the bee's leg and put in the hair a, a plant to produce wax to pick up pollen. This is what I call excellence. We need that spirit in our culture. Well, time for you to go eat lunch.
Let's go home. I ain't got to say nothing else to you. You got enough to get mad with me for the next three weeks. So get over it now. Forgive me for anything I did that may not have been in keeping with the Word of God. But if it was in the Word of God, may it hit you even harder. <laughs> Can I hear an amen? amen? All right. I want to declare a blessing on you, and then we're going to go. If you heard God's voice today, and you are saying, Lord, I am willing to be colonized by heaven, stand up on your feet. Willing to be colonized by heaven. That should be everybody. Tell your neighbor, the Lord spoke to me. <clears throat> Tell your neighbor, I heard him, and I'm going to obey him. I will submit to the governor. Let's hold hands together. Thank you once again for listening to this message as we hope that it has been a blessing to you. Our goal is to show you new paths and opportunities so that you can discover your purpose. It is your love, support, and partnership that makes Monroe Global possible. Please visit us online at www.monroeglobal.com for more product, partnership, or to join us at one of our live events around the world.